Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining the Sales Hacker event and spending the next um, hour or so with us. If this is your first time, you have chosen a fantastic first event to attend. We've got three folks here um, to talk about peer-to-peer -peer learning, how to take your best rep strategies and apply them, share them with the rest of your team, and just uh, fostering a, an environment of collaboration, even when you know our, our whole team is remote. So um, I'm really excited for it. And the folks that we have here have some just really incredible strategies that they've seen with their own teams that they're going to share with you. Um, so uh, I'm so excited. We're, we're going to give folks just a couple of minutes uh, to roll in. And then I will get out of the way here in just a moment. So um, first, some quick housekeeping. Uh, open up your chat. Make sure that it's set to everyone so that everyone in the audience uh, can see your questions and thoughts during today's event. Um, so let's get the conversation uh, kicked off there. Tell us your name and your role, and maybe tell us you know your favorite aspect of your role in the chat. Um, so go ahead, drop those in there. We want this to be super interactive, so um, be sure to chat with the other attendees and take advantage of being live. If you have, uh, when you have questions for um, the panel, please add those to the Q&A box um, and we'll pull them in. So very excited to introduce you to Sean, CEO of Flock J, the one who'll be facilitating this conversation um, today with a really incredible panel. So Sean, thank you so much uh, for being here. Would you tell us a little bit about yourself and I'll, I'll let you take it away with uh, introductions and jump in. Cool. Thanks so much, Sam. And, and hi, everyone. As Sam mentioned, um, please uh, jump into the chat, uh, drop your name, where you're uh, zooming in from, and don't hesitate to share a fun fact as well. We love fun facts at Flockche. Um, and we'll give everyone a couple of minutes to gather in um, just to get settled and sorted as all of our previous meetings were probably wrapping up. Um, so I'll do intros uh, and all that in two minutes or so. But in the meantime, uh, I am zooming in from just north of San Francisco. Uh, you can see the forest behind me. Uh, this is where we live. Uh, perfect setting for a Taylor Swift music video. Very folklore uh, in terms of vibe. So I'll let everyone settle in and then we'll jump into it in about two minutes. But in the meantime, uh, we'll see where folks are dialing in from. We've got some folks from Phoenix. Uh, we got some folks from Austin. Minnetonka, wow. Uh, really exciting to see folks from all over uh, the country. La Grande, Oregon. Nice to see you. North Carolina. Cool. So I'll kick things off, as I mentioned. Um, I'm Sean Hathermani. I'm the founder and CEO of FlockJ. Um, we are passionate about all things sales, and uh, we provide a knowledge sharing platform to centralize the wisdom of teams so everyone can do their best work. And I'm particularly excited today because one of the best perks of my job is I get to learn from and build with uh, folks who are deeply passionate about um, doing your best work uh, in sales and unlocking the potential within everyone in the sales team, whether that's on the individual contributor, account executive, or SDR level, or the manager level. So we've got two of the best of the game here today um, who have gotten the distinct pleasure to know. Uh, Megan Williamson, welcome Megan. Megan joins us as a top account executive from Upwork, and Drew joins us as a senior sales leader from Carrot Fertility. Thanks guys for joining. Thanks for having us, yeah. Maybe before we dive into the nitty gritty, we'd love to hear your own fun facts, um, to hear what you guys have on your mind. Uh, Megan, you shared one before we hopped on. Uh, what's your fun fact for today? So my fun fact is Jaws had the reverse effect on me as a child. It made me love great white sharks. I don't know exactly what that says about me. Um, so that's my fun fact. And the fact I will be swimming with sharks in the ocean next week. Amazing. <laughs> yeah uh let's see fun fact about me um i 
uh, I have a black belt in white tiger kung fu, which is like a really cool niche martial art. And I also currently study Wing Chun. Um, both focus on mindfulness and uh, and centering yourself, which is really cool. Y'all are holding out the juiciest fun facts <laughs> I've heard <laughs> in a long time. Um, I feel pretty proud of my fun fact, but it pales in comparison to Kung Fu and Sharks. Uh, we are expecting our first child in a few months, so uh, really excited about that. And uh, I want to dive in since there's a lot to get through today, and I'm really curious to hear both of your thoughts and for the audience to benefit from your collective wisdom. I think something on all of our minds is we're looking to big 2022 targets and big 2022 hiring targets as well, is we've got all these tools. We've got all this raw material, emails, call recordings, training materials, things like that, that are sort of trapped in our systems. Yet I think we're all asking ourselves the question, how can we really unlock the potential of our team? And in many cases, the performance is still weighted where 80% of the results are coming from 20% of the folks. And the rest are sort of like trying to figure it out on their own. So I'll kick it over to you both to maybe start things off. Is how are you guys seeing the current landscape unfold and evolve? And how do we really move the dial to get that middle 50% plus of folks to really access their true potential and learn from the best practices of their team? Yeah. You want to go first? <laughs> I can kick things off. Yeah. I think, um, I think what I've become uncomfortably familiar with now that we are all remote is that I, I, and probably a lot of you out there have relied heavily on coincidental collaboration. Like, oh, we can sit next to each other and then therefore we can learn from each other and I can look over your shoulder and learn something. Uh, and yet the, the biggest effect that I've had as a leader on my team is being very intentional about centralizing those best practices. So like the difference between the top reps and, and the struggling reps are, is really access to that information. How do they get in touch with what are best practices and how do they implement those? And so I, moving towards a much more intentional collaboration has had a massive impact on our organization. And, uh, and, it's, and it's honestly helped a lot of folks who would have struggled and failed become you know, okay and then become good and then become better. So, I mean, for me, that's, that's, that's the majority of it, yeah. Yeah, and I like the word intention that you used there. Like, it was coincidental before because we were on a sales floor. You could hear things, but now, like, there has to be intention there. And even from the rep side, as great as it is, leaders, like, are trying to make that space. Like, reps have to be intentional, of, like, seeking out and collaborating with those around them. And, like, what kept me out of sales for the longest time is it seemed to be, like, such a butting heads competing against someone. But, like, when I put the mindset, when I entered, of, like, I'm going to compete with myself and help everyone else around me. Like if reps also take that mindset and create that space, I think even like coincidental collaboration can still exist alongside the intentional. Totally. And I think there are two very important and distinct responsibilities in moving from coincidental to intentional for both the sales rep and the manager, right? Because there's this tension, as you mentioned, Megan, where the manager might tend to blame things on the reps. Maybe you know they weren't doing the activity or doing the things and there's the blame game coming downstream when their boss is asking them why things aren't working. Mm -hmm. And then the reps are feeling under-supported and under-nurtured and are struggling to understand what's working. And they're like, I'm not being managed. My manager is being pulled in 10 different directions and uh, I don't really have any meaningful interaction. So I think we're touching on a really important responsibility on both sides. So we'd love to hear from both of your perspectives and probably a question that a lot of folks are wrestling is, is how do you create that ownership and responsibility as a rep and ownership and responsibility as a manager? Because the way the current system is set up, the incentives aren't necessarily there for you to do it, right? As Megan, as you said, most sales reps have kind of been taught to just fend for themselves. Curious for your thoughts on that. Maybe you can start us off on how do you get account executives to take on that responsibility of we versus me? Yeah, I think first you have to like start with yourself. And so I was like, how can I foster this? It's 
one of those, like you have to just begin by taking action. So like, if you want to start it, like even as stuff as simple as like throwing coffee sinks on people's calendar that you don't typically collaborate with. And the first one might be like awkward or you're not really sure what you're talking about, but like staying consistent with that. And something I know Drew and I talked about on like the pre-meet to this is celebrating other people's wins way bigger than your own. It's like, yes, I love closing deals, but like if my work wife closed a deal, you must believe I'm like putting all the emojis in the Slack channel, but the same with every single rep. Cause then they kind of know like this person wants to see the others win just as much. And then it just naturally allows like conversation to start to happen where people be like, Oh, okay. Like I know you do this. Well, I feel comfortable enough now to come talk to you because they're, you're taking down that guard and that gate. Yeah. I mean, a hundred percent that if you celebrate wins and you celebrate people sharing best practices, they will, they will do more of it, honestly. And it's, you know, often a rep will come up with something and be like, oh, I think this thing is actually a best practice. And I, from my, from my perspective as a leader, my responsibility is to be like, yes, keep bringing those to me. Keep telling me what you think are best practices. And then we can help determine whether this is actually something that moves the needle or if it's something that helps you personally. We can help like uh, contextualize that. And if it does turn out to be something that could be really valuable, then we need to have somewhere central that we can share that wisdom where it's structured. The reps know where to find it. The reps know how to read it. The reps know what to look for and where to look for it. It's searchable, stuff like that. So I have like a Google doc with a template. And honestly, it's like a half measure, but it's like a hundred percent more than most people are doing. And it's, and, and it's had a lot of impact, but going back to Megan, what Megan was saying, if you can create a culture where people are surfacing that sharing that and celebrating it, that's like the cornerstone. That's where it starts. Yeah. And I think a great point to that, like one of our strategic directors said to me once and like even the IC role, he's like, find a way to like still as an IC to lead from the back. So like one thing, and this isn't even something I do great, but one of my colleagues says like, if she's listening to a gong call and it's not her own, she'll still take a snippet and like share it to the entire team. Again, like pushing out what someone else is doing well that you notice. Cause for a lot of us, it is sometimes uncomfortable to even like shout out what you're doing well or something you've learned because you don't know how people will react or be like, Oh, I know that. Totally. And I want to come back to both of these pieces because it seems like on the individual side, a lot of the responsibility, Megan starts with really amplifying and celebrating wins and creating safety to start conversations around. This is a best practice. Here's what I'm doing because there's a lot of vulnerability associated with that. And then a lot of the managerial responsibility is, okay, how do we refine that and structure it and iterate on it and give you context for, hey, we've tried this before, it has worked and it hasn't. But maybe sticking on the first piece and and sort of tying it back to how we started this conversation from coincidental to intentional. When we were all in person, and who knows, maybe we'll come back to that in some form, it was suboptimal in some ways because it relied on being next to different people, but it also created built-in time in the day where there was very low barriers to turning to someone, whoever that was, and asking for help, right? And now I think a lot of the holdup that individual contributors might feel, and I'd be love to hear your thoughts on this, Megan, is, okay, like scheduling a coffee feels wonky and weird, or I don't know when to ping my manager because they're online all the time, and busy all the time, and I don't want to, you know, Uh, disturb them, but I also need some help. And I think without that natural built-in proximity, Mm -hmm. there might be a hurdle, right? Unless you're, you have that in you to do it. So how have you seen, you know, whether it's in your team or yourself, uh, create that comfort to create those moments of safety and interaction where you are um, starting to connect with other people on your team? Yeah, I think creating that space is one, sorry, managers and leaders on the call are listening, like create that Slack channel or that space without a leader in it, like because more organic conversation and vulnerability, vulnerability words today will happen there in that space because sometimes you're like, oh, do I actually want to ask this question in front of my manager versus with them being removed, like it creates that safe space. And even if you create it and it takes a moment for the conversation to get started, like I would encourage every rep to like be one of the first ones to speak up in it of like, 
hey, I just really messed up this call. Like, is anyone open to taking a listen and giving me feedback and like asking for it first instead of just waiting for someone else to come do it? Drew, have you seen this and folks in your team really creating that flywheel effect of folks even feeling comfortable to start sharing um, and interacting with others in the team? You know, frankly, uh, it, it became an, a cornerstone of our, our culture on our team and it became like really vital. And that was actually put really easy because I, you know, like nine months ago, I had a much smaller team. And I had one person on the team, like Megan was saying is at the beginning of this, she was an absolute rock star. She was looking for best practices. She was sharing best practices. She was only competing with herself and she was absolutely a front runner. But she was like helping me institutionalize a culture of collaboration such that we can share openly. We can talk about like how we've messed up. We can talk about like, hey, I, I think this su call sucked and these are the reasons why. Can I get some feedback? And so because that has been institutionalized as part of our our culture, I can then promote it and push and keep moving towards it. But it has to be them. They have to be bought in. And then also going back to what Megan said, there it needs to be a, a space for it. Like having your own space outside of managers, it's fantastic. And actually I've been begging my team to do that and they finally did it. And so they have their own Slack channel and their own meetings and stuff. Because like there's lots they're going to learn from us for sure. But there's also lots they're going to learn from each other. Uh, the other piece is like we have a Slack channel for, for our team. And then, and it also has some other teams that are plugged into it for notification stuff. And then we have like a separate sub uh, channel that's just private and it's just for them to be able to ask any questions they want. And the, and the description of it is ask questions from training all the way through advanced stuff so that they know like there's no stupid questions. An advanced rep can ask something really basic about how to create an opportunity. And it's just a format and a place for people to know okay, if I want to ask maybe a vulnerable question and have my managers included, but not other teams, I can ask it here. But if I want to ask it absent the managers, I can ask it there. So knowing like where to ask it, having the space, having multiple formats, and then really encouraging uh, that share and like uh, celebrating it. When somebody shares something vulnerable, we're like, wow, fantastic job. Great job. Like that's modeling exactly what we're looking for. Well done. That's, that's excellent work. Yeah. I love that. And there are two things I want to come back to. The first is sort of like across both of your observations. It really starts from model behavior at the top. And that top could either be someone who is that rep, right, who has that energy, whether they're high performing or just a natural leader within the group. I think I've seen this across companies we've supported at FlockJ where uh, the behavior of the team starts by modeling on the behavior of your top reps, right? If I'm somewhere in the middle of the pack, I'm like, oh, Megan's doing this and she's being super comfortable and honest, even in sharing how she just goofed up a call, that gives me some permission to do it. And similarly, if my manager is creating and celebrating and encouraging us to do that, if Drew or someone like it is normalizing that behavior by sharing out something that didn't work, then I might feel more comfortable to do that. Um, so that seems like a definitely an actionable thread where it starts with just that cornerstone of a couple of people and then repetition and, and cycles to, to keep that going. The thing I want to double click into from there is that a lot of this seems to be uh, in and around tools like Slack, right? And we have a saying, uh, I'm still here on my camera, welcome back. Uh, we have a saying at FlockJ where Slack is where amazing ideas go to die. <laughs> where you've got all of this wisdom and you kind of like want to get it in somewhere when it's happening, but then it's stuck in the infinite scroll vortex and you don't have it, right? And so talk to me a little bit about that. Um, how do you guys sort of grapple with that? Um, because there's so many different pieces of that because the same questions and same ideas start to be asked over and over again. So describe how that's played out and some of the tensions and some of the things you've been observing in each of your teams. Yeah. Um, you know, absolutely. Somebody will post the best practice on Slack. And if we didn't capture that and have that stored somewhere where it is understandable and actionable, and it would 100% be lost. And I kept seeing that happen. I was like, oh, that's a great tidbit. And then it'd scroll and then it'd be lost in the feed. And then another one and it'd scroll and be lost in the feed. And I was like, oh no, we need to capture all of this. And honestly, uh, just having, again, this is a half measure, but a Google Doc with a template. Like this, these are the field things you need to capture so that somebody else can come back to this, read it, understand the context, understand how to use it, where to use it, and when to use it. 
um, and then have that all of those tidbits be stored somewhere centrally and have those be categorized. A lot of lift, honestly, a lot of work. But if I did nothing else as a manager and I just did that, that would have the biggest impact on my org, hands down, period, above everything else. If only there were a platform that does that for <laughs> you. <laughs> uh, Megan, curious for your thoughts. What have you seen uh, in terms of the Slack vortex and just different places where this wisdom is being shared? Is it all in Slack? Is it different places? Is it meetings? Um, how, how are, yeah, how, how yeah. are you figuring this out? Um, probably similar to Drew, I will say Slack is definitely a vortex. Like, as you said, that someone posts like a great snippet to use on like a LinkedIn outreach or something. And then everyone comments or like even the threads of like, this is great. And then it goes up and you can never go find it again. Even the search feature doesn't help, but pretty similar to Drew. And again, like very fortunate, like our team has created this collaboration space. Like one of our, one of my coworkers on our team, she went and like grabbed the snippets, created that Google doc and like put them in and then shared it out to the team immediately of like saw results with this or like this verbiage that someone else used. And I, again, I think that's one of the biggest things, like especially not only like getting the information together, but then also recognizing where it came from. Mm. is a big thing is even though like she grabbed all of it every verbiage every best practice ties back to who actually wrote that email who shared that best practice so like yes she gets all the recognition from putting it together but the people who still did the work still have their recognition totally and tell me a bit more about that so associating the owner or the originator or the creator with that how does that drive behavior in your team and why is that something that's so important well I think it's important like when you see someone get shouted out for like a verbiage or like an email that you wrote and then like the person who actually probably wrote it or like shared it with you is just like wait I I wrote that originally like their boss just saw it from them kind of can put up walls if you're not giving credit where credit's due so like she did that like when we had sales often that we were inputting templates like even though people shared their best practices with me, like underneath like the subject, like the how to find it was attached to a person's like name or initials. So like, again, even though I'm putting all these templates in there, doesn't matter. Like the person who wrote it is getting that recognition. Like that is their template. Because again, like people, if they're putting in the work, they want to be recognized for it, no matter what stage they did it at. Yeah, totally. That's that's a really important thing. Not only like who posted it, but when they posted it as well. Because if it, and that's the other thing is like if uh, it's a badge of honor to get a best practice into our best practices list, and you absolutely should have your name on it because you've done the work to surface it. But then like when did you post it, and what was relevant at that time, and what were we doing at that time, and is it still appropriate? Like yeah, these things are really really important for centralizing that wisdom. And then how do you scale that? And do you have best practices for LinkedIn over here and email over here? And then, yeah, how do you coordinate that? Totally. And I can also see how this gets really sprawly and really messy really fast, especially as the business is changing so quickly, who you're selling into, how you're changing different cadences, what tools you're using, how you're using the tools. Um, how do you tease out and refine the most critical elements, a lot of these best practices to make them actionable, right? Because we've kind of talked a bit about the capture piece, which is the first and important part um, of any knowledge sharing or centralized you know, way of, of collecting wisdom. But how do you actually then start to refine and convert them into something that's worthwhile? Because I can see how this can be a sprawl of lots of different things in one doc that's hard to maintain. And then as you said, Megan, it becomes a lot of text. Yeah, I mean, I, for us, it's been structure. So like a clear template, um, clear channels to uh, offer up that those best practices. So they'll say, you know, in Slack or in a one-on-one -on -one or in a team meeting, oh, this is a thing I learned or this is a thing I'm doing or this is a thing I've been testing that's been working. And then what we do is we have a manager sort of screen that and be like, okay, is this applicable more broadly? If it is, how would we sort of structure it and, and communicate it? And then we go to the template. So, you know, name, date is the, are the first two fields. And then like, when would you use this? Why would you use this? What's the context? And then what's the action item underneath that? Uh, and then what's the intended result? And so having all of those listed out as part of the template, they know if they're going to fill out best practices, they have to ha be able to write it up such that somebody who doesn't know them can go read it, understand where, when, why to use it, when to use it, and how to use it, and then, and then act on it based on that. 
Jim, I feel like I need to steal that. Like ours right now, it's, it's not to that level, but I love that. Like what was the intention and like, where's like the outcome of like when best to use it? Yeah. Cause like, I think that's sometimes missing as we like grab best practices and just put them in a dog. Like that's such an important piece that is often missing in all organizations, including like how my team structures it right now. Yeah. And I think that takes a lot of work just to be really candid, right. To keep that organized, to keep that level of structure. Um, and also for someone to own that responsibility. Um, and so maybe that's sort of like the next piece of it is, let's say you're cataloging a lot of this wisdom and you're starting to structure it a little bit. Um, how do you then start to match what folks need with the things that you've collected? How do you connect the dots to say, okay, like I might benefit from this. And if I'm a rep, I'm going to try that. Or if I'm a manager, I think Megan's really great at closing, but maybe I can match her with a little bit more in qualification. Uh, curious how both of you are seeing this in your teams and just across the industry. I would say team wise, like I have a great leader who like will call out like here's what people's strengths are and kind of like set matching that way. But also like within our team and again, being vulnerable and like making that space, like people will reach out and say like, you're great at this. Can you like listen to a call? Help me with this. And like, I think to have that, like it's again, going back to creating that space is the biggest importance. You can't expect people to call that out or managers to even feel comfortable to call that out on someone like because it's looked at as a weakness even though I think there's strength and weakness like you have to have that space for people to just be able to discuss it and like go to one another and it doesn't always have to be very structured or formatted yeah when a rep comes to me and says I'm struggling with x or let's say I'm struggling with prospecting my first instinct is to be like, oh, great. So what resources are you getting for yourself around prospecting such that you can get better at it? And so they know that that's going to be the first question. And so then it, a lot of times I think what ends up happening is before it comes up, they're like, okay, what resource am I going to get? Oh, I'm going to get these resources. And then it's not even a discussion we need to have uh, because they're like, oh, I know that I have you know, our central wisdom. I know that there are these other reps that are doing really well on this front. I know that there are these uh, people who are promoted who have done this job before who I can lean on. And so getting them in the mindset of like, okay, where, how do I help myself? And then keeping it focused on like, your, your job is to improve yourself. Like that's, that's a cornerstone of what we do. So can you do that via, you know, finding out mentors? Can you do that finding outside resources? Can you do that finding inside resources? And then, you know, where are you going to look? What's your priority is going to be? I think that's really cool because what we're starting to talk about is actually what a lot of companies like claim in marketing lingo, but really hard to do, which is cloning your best reps. But what you described, Drew, seems to be giving you leverage as a manager, right? Because that exact set of steps means you can coach and affect more people because they're self-coaching and peer coaching based on structures and systems you've created. Megan, have you seen this kind of thing play out when you're struggling or hit a rough patch? What are some of the things you do to get through it? And, and what are some of the things that um, you wish there were more of, um, you know, uh, that you could, you could count on? Yeah, I think with that, like when I struggle, like I initially turn to not only like who in my company are like peer to peers good at it, but what I'll actually do is tend to go outside of my company as well to find like peer to peer connections or even just they might be senior and I'm not or anything like that to be able to like share that wisdom. One, I think it's sometimes easier to talk in that space, but also it just gives a great outside perspective and like leveraging those resources because like we live in a digital world. We have access to so many resources. So it's really easy for us. I'll just say, Oh, I'm struggling with this. And like, I feel like probably many people go like, let me talk to someone. So I feel safe. That's also struggling with that. But like the best thing to do is like push back on anyone. Like Drew said, it's like, what resources are you leveraging with that? Um, so for me, it, it is 100% like peer to peer first, whether yeah. inside or outside. And I, I kind of want to dig a little deeper on the outside portion. And I'm really curious for your view, Drew, as a manager. I think you're one of the rare managers who takes a really active and hands on interest in facilitating this kind of environment. A lot of reps aren't so lucky to have this kind of system and structure and support. And even if they did, some of the best practices internally may not be models that folks should follow, 
right? Um, and that starts with this chain of command of, 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 folk, of practices that aren't necessarily that great. And so curious your thoughts on what it looks like to get um, that peer wisdom outside of your company. Do you ever encourage or facilitate that to happen amongst your reps? Do you see that happening in your team? Is that something you would welcome or do you see that as disruptive to the best practices that you want to instill in your own team? If someone like Megan was like, hey, Drew, I just went to X, Y, and Z folks and I'm trying it this way kind of thing. My first reaction to that is like, I went out and did research on another way of doing things and I want to test it out. My first thing is like, absolutely celebrate. Like, that's fantastic. Like you are looking for resources. You are trying to improve yourself. You're implement, you're trying to implement something new. And that's a hundred percent, a fantastic thing to do. Keep doing that. And also like, think about it in terms of the process and think about it in terms of what you can share with your peers. Right. So not only can you, not only is it a, a, a hunt to find a technique that could potentially help you become more effective, but it's a hunt to find a technique that also still works in the process and is something you can share with your peers. So th helping them think about it in terms of scalability. Um, but honestly, the reason I'm passionate about this is because I didn't have it. I never had it. Nobody ever centralized the wisdom. I was out there on my own. And I was like, this is, this is not right. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I think it's, it's a really important piece and, and I will continue to being passionate about it, but any rep who raises their hand and says, I'm looking for resources, first step, celebrate second step, help them understand how to implement that with the context of our process and our, our, the industry we're breaking into. Drew, quick question for you from our like conversation earlier in the week and let me know if I'm remembering correctly. You also have like what best practices didn't work list like to run alongside that that I think also makes a really good case to like have a safe space if you bring in outside things like this might work let's test or like oh hey we actually did that like by the way exactly I, I, how many people have team members on their team who have reinvented the wheel I'm willing to bet it's everybody because uh, of that exact thing, <laughs> right? Yeah, because it's it's just as important to know what didn't work as what did. And when when you're collaborating with uh, with a rep who's like, I found this thing, I'm going to experiment. Yes, 100%, let's experiment. You're, we're going to run this test. These are the results we're looking for. And when it doesn't work, we also need to document that so that we don't have the next 20 reps over the next four or five years trying that same technique, which we know doesn't work. Um, and I think that's probably maybe more important than best practices at sometimes. I think that's so important. And I think there's so many like hidden benefits of sharing what didn't work because it not only prevents reinventing the wheel, it also normalizes like taking risks as well. And it also normalizes no dumb idea um, because you're actually cataloging them, referring to them, coming back to them. Um, and it gives you a bit of a living timeline of the business too, where you can see just how the growth is happening and how we're improving uh, over time, which I think is super, super important. Um, so related to this in a way to actually capture and start coaching on these, on these ideas, it does come from this idea of uh, energy, right? This is a consistent theme I've heard, like that energy of the sales floor in a remote environment. I think the first question I have to both of you and maybe we can even do a poll uh, in the audience, is do you think we'll have the same energy of the sales floor sort of like in this after time versus the before time? Drew, I know you have opinions here, so I'll let you start. Um, uh, no, I don't think we're going to have anything close to the energy we had before. And I think that's a good thing. I think we're going to have a fundamental shift in the in our in what we do as salespeople, and I think we should embrace that with open arms. We have an opportunity now to essentially restructure, you know, what it is to be a sales rep, especially in a modern time with a you know forward thinking, tech focused company. Um, and I think we should, you know, with that comes a lot of opportunities and a lot of uncertainty. We were very comfortable with what we had. It, it, you know, we 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 realized the value of of coincidental collaboration. And I think this gives us an opportunity to be much more intentional about our collaboration. I can't control the energy on my team. I can't control the culture on my team. All I do is hire and hope that those folks continue to foster the best parts of the culture that we have. And so uh, from my perspective, the only thing I can do on the energy front is uh, continue to help motivate 
better understand my reps, better understand what motivates them, um, stay as connected as I can without putting too much meetings on their schedule, and just really um, have a new dynamic that we lean into around collaboration, around internal communication, around what it means to be successful and how we celebrate our wins. Yeah, I agree. Like looking back into, and I love the Salesforce culture and like the fun that was there, but I don't think we're ever going to go back to that. Even the handful of times that I've gone into the office in this last two years, that environment is gone. Like when you're there, you're excited to see people, you catch up. But then if you're taking a call, which again, people used to be able to hear, you're now in an office. So like you can have your mask off and stuff like that. And even if we like go past that, I don't think that energy is going to be there anymore. And so just as leaders need to be intentional, I think all sales reps need to be intentional because to be honest, like I don't think as a sales professional, you'll survive staying in a silo. Yeah. And I think uh, I've, yeah, like it, it's just not sustainable. Like it's such a, it's such a, um, a job that's driven by overcoming failure and rejection that we're just not wired to stay in a silo and keep banging our head against the wall. And I think a lot of sales teams culturally, because there was something like a sales floor, used that as a crush to fall back on this brute force sink or swim kind of thing, right? Because yeah, we're all collaborative, we're all in, in person, but then you know, I'm not gonna put in the extra cycles to foster collaboration because we're here and yeah. we've got the like pump up. Um, but really, it's it's kind of like trying to to get better at something by doing the same thing and hoping for different results. Which is the definition of insanity, right? Which I believe a really smart person who is decently good at physics <laughs> said is uh, the definition of, of insanity. So I do think, um, I don't know if you guys have watched this show, Station Eleven, but there's this quote, there is no before, where we've moved past, right? We have to sort of like step step away from trying to recreate in weird Zelda-like, you know, keyboard strokes trying to go into sales floor rooms. Like I've seen a lot of those kind of tools and it's not, I'm curious if you guys have seen them and if it's working, but there's so many of these Zoom mixers and different tools. Meg, I'm curious if you've seen anything like this at your company and how do you strike that balance in creating organic, new asynchronous energy versus trying to just replicate something in the past? Yeah, I think when like everyone went remote first, we tried that, like we had Zoom up, like to do dial blocks all together. So like we could still like report back on what was happening. And it was, it was chaos. It was failure. Like it just, it wasn't good. And I don't think it helped anyone. I think it also made us like way less productive. Um, and so for me, I think it's again, like making space for collaboration and not trying to mimic what was before because like that's gone you know it's instead of replicating like how do we take the sales floor and make it into this why not embrace what we have and like use the technology that we have with like slack rooms with being able to put like even just stuff as like wine sinks on your calendar at like the end of the day for colleagues to come and shoot the shit with each other and I think it creates that still where you get like the collaboration but you're, we're not trying to force this digital first into an old way of how we all worked and collaborated. Yeah. If you, if you're, if your instinct is to be like, how do I recreate what we had? You might've had some crutches that you're still leaning on. And yep. so, yeah, definitely think about it in terms of what can I do? Blank sheet of paper. How can I make a culture of collaboration? And really like Megan was saying, having those syncs with your colleagues where it's unstructured, and it's, it's just about support, learning, or even just connecting. It's absolutely vital. And what I found is that for early reps, when they're first starting, they don't want to do it because they don't, they, they've never been on a team that really does that too much. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to force your hand. And I give, I assign them a buddy. And I'm like, you meet with this buddy a few times this week, and then they get a new buddy and you meet with that buddy a few times. So that at least they have two people that are connected with in their first two weeks. And they're like, okay, I know I can go to these folks. And then they learn, oh, those folks are actually meeting with other folks and then and they're supporting each other and they're like listening and talking and learning and connecting and without that I, we don't have a culture honestly and i can't foster that i can't like be like you guys go meet with each other um i can be like hey i'll give you 50 bucks if you go meet and you can cover the cost of whatever you want and we do that but um that still has to be they have to initiate it going to the to the collaborative zooms though we did have a couple of um hosted 
Hardee's that uh, an outside uh, company did. And I was very skeptical. I was like, this is going to be cheesy. This is going to be corny. I'm nobody's going to like feel connected after this. I was wrong. I, I had to eat my words and we're going to do more of that. And it's actually been really fun, but yeah, not yeah. The, the, the team, uh, team calling on a zoom. Uh, I shied away from that one. <laughs> you were smart too. Don't do it. But same with you. Like as Steph is like companies are like, Oh, well, people actually enjoy this. Um, there was an in-person place in Chicago and I'm blanking on the name, but they switched to zoom and like you had to run around your house or Airbnb if you're like me and find the most random items and stuff. But like people got so into it and it was so fun and like brought that like energy and team outings back into it. And so it's like as much like, yes, we try to collaborate, like also make sure like people are having fun together still because that was such a key element to sales. Yeah. I mean, we, we've trained close to you know, a thousand folks in an academy entirely online even before the pandemic. And part of why we've launched this knowledge sharing platform to centralize wisdom is we saw that magic. If you can actually build relationships like this, it's different, but there's magic in it, right? Like Megan can be in Chicago, Drew can be somewhere else, I can be somewhere else. And there is that shared experience. And in many ways that sets the groundwork and the permissibility to have the collaboration. So it's not the only thing, but it's almost like the first thing that then normalizes um sharing things on the platform yeah so maybe to start, a domino effect. yeah exactly it's just domino effect sorry to to cut you off megan um so maybe to start bringing it all together and i want to leave some time for questions uh at the end as well so we've talked a bit about moving from coincidental to intentional in terms of collaboration we've talked a little bit about some of the sort of piecemeal ways that are, you know, that this is happening in Teams, whether it's in Slack or Google Sheet or a document, some of the ways that that can work, some of the ways in which that can break. Um, and now I kind of just want to start to bring that all together and say, okay, like, how do you ensure this continues, right? That that stays fresh, that people are continuing to, you know, build rituals into their life. I think one of the observations I've had is it's really hard to break behavior, right? It's really hard to change behavior. And if you're used to just dialing and being measured on your activity every day, um, it's hard to break out of that and actually share that out. So maybe we can start with you, um, Megan. Um, how do you ensure that this continues for you personally? And how have you seen it continue in your team or not? And what are some ideas you might have? Well, I think first, like you have to take ownership yourself, like especially as the IC, no one's going to do it for you. But like, if you were at January now, if you look back at the last year, if you didn't hit the numbers or like where you wanted to end your year, like this is a great time to be like, what do I need to actually do different? Because if you're going to use the definition of insanity, do the exact same thing you did the first six months and then try to make a change, like you're already behind. So if you didn't like the way you ended last year, or even if you did and you want collaboration, like put the onus on you. One, it, like set up those things with people, but like reach out and say, hey, I know you're good at this. I struggled with this last year versus like the general coffee sinks. Because I think if you just start with that and again, stating your intentions of it and make it consistent or like set a goal each week of doing one or how many a month, like it just becomes a new learned behavior that you steadily grow on. I wish everyone on my reps did that. <laughs> <laughs> We'd have an absolute rock star team. <laughs> it's true. Right. And I think that's the question. There aren't that many Megans out there and we can, <laughs> we can learn from you. There's a lot more out there. <laughs> Drew, what are, what are your thoughts to keep this flywheel going? Um, because someone's got to own it and deliver it um, both at the contribution contribution level and then the curation level. Yeah, so we celebrate it when folks are like, I think I have one or, oh, I think this could be a, like a best practice or, oh, I want to have a, I have this experiment I want to run. So we celebrate that first and foremost. And then also we have folks post their wins because sometimes they don't realize a best practice is a win and vice versa. And so they'll be like, Oh, you know, I, I, this thing happened and, and I got a meeting booked. Um, and we go, well, what did you do to get that to happen? Oh, okay. So you're doing this thing that's a little bit outside of the system. Great. Let's actually document it. And then when they do document it, we celebrate it. Be like, Hey, blah, blah, blah has a new addition to the, to the best practices doc. And then, and then we celebrate that. And then we call it out in the sales, uh, in the SDR meeting. 
and and we talk about it in, in those real terms be like hey this person is working working hard and they they tried this thing hey do you want to tell us a little bit about this this uh pro tip that you developed and then um we have them share it because it's it's a it's a badge of pride and then folks see other people sharing they see other people creating these best practices they see them getting recognized for that and they go oh i want to do that i want to be a leader i want to i i could see myself doing that and then also we tell them straight up like the folks who do this are the ones that are on the top of our list for promotions <laughs> like we care about this a lot and this is a top metric for us to define who we're going to promote yeah that part i think that that <laughs> part is uh is really how to do it if i were to bring together some of the things that you guys are mentioning first it seems like creating regular moments whether it is regular syncs whether it's your weekly one-on-one -on -one in a you know with a manager where both the manager and the ae or the sdr are talking about it and setting goals around it and actually recognizing that you did do a call review this week or you did do a bunch of call reviews and that's amazing and what did you learn i think there's got to be first some kind of regular practice like anything else the second thing i'm hearing is recognition and that recognition can be ad hoc as it's happening but it also sounds like and and correct me if i'm wrong here for for both of you that there's almost regular scheduled moments of recognition too whether it's in the weekly meeting or whether it's in the one-on-one -on -one, or whether it's ending the day whether it's an email that goes out um figuring out a system for regular recognition um and then the third seems like there's some kind of like competitive spirit and uh way to say hey Megan's doing this. Maybe I want to do it too, so I can also stand out as a rep. Um, so there's that leaderboard and gamification function of it, where if I do this enough, I'll be viewed as a leader internally, um, and I'll be recognized for it, and maybe even promoted for it. And maybe that's a good. First of all, did I miss anything in there? No, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Back that's, up on that. That's the sauce. Um, <laughs> hope everyone's taking notes. Uh, <laughs> Megan, maybe from your perspective, let's say you're outperforming and let's say you're up for promotion and you're trying to weigh the benefit between helping your team and spending more time to hit a number. Mm -hmm. How do you balance those and how can folks on the call encourage other top performers who may be entirely you know, in their, in their focus zone of just focusing on their number to take time to um, focus on lifting others up as a way to accelerate their career instead of just their number. Yeah, like, and I think, and I recently had a conversation internally, like, with this, like, you can decide what type of leader you want to be. You can be an AE, independent contractor, forever, and, like, still be a leader without, like, going into leadership. And so it's taking the onus on that of, like, knowing, like, having confidence in yourself. Like, if you have a number, you're going to hit it. But like, no matter what, you can take that time to support someone else to hit their numbers as well. Because like, at the end of the day, if only one of us and then 10 others aren't hitting it, company's not going to be there. So it doesn't matter how great you are individually, like you have to help others get there as well to like move forward, like with your own career or any of it, like it all needs to be there. If it's just you, your career will crash and burn in that sense. So like, why not help other people out? I love it. And then often less discussed is actually from the perspective of the manager, Drew. How do you incentivize them to really care? Let's mm -hmm. say your team is firing on all cylinders and things are great. A manager might say, there's not much I need to do here to collect my paycheck and move on. And if things aren't working out, it's like, it's not my fault, it's, it's my reps. And I think there hasn't been that layer of both accountability and ability for managers to demonstrate what they're doing every day to their senior report. So how do you motivate your managers to take on this behavior and stay organized in logging and tracking their coaching interactions, uh, if at all? Yeah. Um, their shortcomings are my responsibility and their wins are their own is like yeah. the first way I think about it. Um, and Megan, the idea of giving back to move forward is the most important thing. And so what I do is I highlight the reps who are doing that and then I promote them and then I promote them again. Um, they have a clear path upward and we call it out as a key piece, but I go, Hey, 
this rep, who is now an account executive, who was an enterprise SDR, who was an SDR, the reason they moved up is because they did these things, you know, they hit their numbers and they were killing it. But also this other thing where they're collaborating, they're supporting, they're providing best practices, they're coaching other team members. And guess what? That's the thing that makes them better. It's like the actually coaching other people makes you better at your job because it ha- allows you to understand what you're doing to a whole more deep degree, which really is, is, is that's the thing that really often propels folks to the next level. If you want to just get good at what you're doing, you could, but if you want to get, become excellent and go to the next level, you're going to find ways to, to really up your game. And, and one of the big ones is teach somebody else. Teach somebody else how to do the best thing that you do, and you will not only get better at that, you'll help the team get better. Uh, And helping the team get better will force you to get better even more, which it's like a compounding effect. I love that. We have this saying at Flockj, watch, do, teach. Mm. And that's how folks get better um, and grow in the job. We care a lot about upper mobility. And I think what you're describing, Drew, is that kind of loop where you're creating almost this learning quota in addition to the sales quota, where if you want to be successful, this number matters a lot, you know, how much you're selling. But this matter, this, this other number, whatever that number is, is really going to accelerate how well you do here. And it's going to have compounding effects. Uh, maybe one last uh, set of things to discuss before we go to any questions is context seems really important. I see a lot of folks sharing you know, calls or things like that. And it's a lot to listen to a 30 minute call, you know, and go through an email sequence. There are endless amounts of this stuff. I ask managers, how many, how many of your reps are actually using the expensive call recording software that you've bought? And can you track that usage? And a lot of them are like, we know we have to have something like this, but I'm not sure. Um, and so talk to me a little bit about um, adding some context to a lot of these best practices. Maybe I'll, I'll offer something I've seen and would love to, to, to hear your thoughts on as well. When we've seen reps record a short video um, or add a little clip that accompanies a call and says, hey, here's what happened and here's what worked well and here's what didn't, uh, would love your feedback on it. The amount of engagement we see is exponentially greater than here's a 30 minute block of a call to listen to. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm curious, as you guys think about fostering these best practices in, this, in these cultures in your team, how are you trying to add that layer of context and relevance that can help drive participation? Um, Megan, curious for your thoughts, because I'm sure you have tons of call recordings that you're asked to, to listen to and, oh, yeah. uh, and share out. Um, how, how do you navigate this? Yeah, I think for, yes, do get asked to listen to a lot of calls. Luckily, the platform we use actually shows my leader, like if we are even to learn ourselves, like listening to others' calls. So that's helpful. But when it comes to context, like if someone's like, hey, can you listen to my call and like give me pointers? You're just like, oh, okay. That's again, time out your calendar. But like if they came to you, I wish they would all come and say like, hey, like, this is where I think I'm struggling. Like, can you listen to this snippet of the call and just send snippets? So right now, like while people are because having to protect my time, but still wanting to help people when they're come and say, hey, can you listen to my call? Like immediate, just as Drew talks about resources. Hey, what are you looking that you need help with? Can you send me the snippet? Because now I'm just listening to 10 minutes versus 30 minutes trying to skip through the fluff or like the setting next steps at the end of the call. That's huge. Yeah. You know, for us, you know, on the SDR side, it's a little bit different, right? Because our calls are two to five minutes long. But the thing is, is if I have no idea how many calls you're listening to of your own, of your peers, uh, if I don't know, you know, like if, if you're getting some feedback, but maybe not very much, uh, if the only call review you're doing is in, when we're doing call review sessions as a team uh, and or having breakout sessions, like that's not nearly enough. You need to be listening to basically every call connect that you have that week, plus the best reps. And so if you're spending like an hour and a half or two hours a week listening to other folks in order to get better, like that's what drives results. But I have no idea what you're listening to. I have no idea how often you're listening to it. I have no idea what kind of feedback you're getting, except for in our sessions that we do together. But then we're only listening to like four calls and you need to be listening to like 20 calls a week. So like the gap there is completely unknown for me and I don't and I, I need a solution to fix it. 
Funny you mentioned that. Um, and I think that's, <laughs> that's really important to highlight because uh, even if you know how many calls your reps are listening to, you don't know what topics those are on, right? And what areas are germane to and being able to have very simple reporting on, hey, this week I listened to 15 calls and in them, the most common areas I was really digging into were discovery, qualification, and objectives. And likewise, as a manager, I know my entire team gave this amount of feedback and it was largely in discovery, but not a lot in objections. Maybe we should focus on that next week. Um, bringing it all together in one place is really important. Uh, I'll pause and see if there are any other questions that are coming in. Feel free to drop them in the Q&A in the chat. Um, but just as a little bit of an intro, uh, FlockJ is a platform that brings all of this together. Um, take the Google Sheets and the Notion docs and all the little things we're talking about, the Slack channels, and bring that business intelligence into the places where your sales reps are already working and centralizing that wisdom. So we're really, really passionate about this uh, area and also love to be helpful to teams and leaders, whether it's an enablement or AEs or managers as they figure out how to implement these best practices. Um, any other uh, closing thoughts from each of you guys, Megan and Drew, before we give folks uh, a few minutes back in their day? No, I think if you're an independent like contributor here, just lean into it. If like you're missing that in your organization, be the first one to just start testing it out. Yeah, and I bet you some really clever individual contributors are going to be reaching out to you, Megan. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm here for it. I would say find me on LinkedIn. I'm here for it. Perfect. I would say this 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 issue is is monumental to the success of teams as well as individuals. Uh, yeah, like Megan said, own it. Like if you want to get good, own it. Be the person in your org to do it, whether leadership is doing it or not, because it'll have a major lift on you. Uh, and if you're a leader, um, doing this will have a significant impact, and it also have uh, there's costs associated with there's time and resources associated with it. So doing it well and doing it in a sustainable fashion is going to be really critical. We could talk about this honestly for so many more hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, uh, feel free to follow up with us after the webinar. We'll send out all the info after this. Thank you so much to both you, Megan, and you, Drew, for taking the time to chat. Thank you, Sam, for helping us organize. And um, yeah, we're really, really passionate about this because as both of you mentioned, it creates win-wins. It makes you look so good as an individual contributor to raise your hand and say, hey, centralizing wisdom and sharing out best practices is that secret sauce that can make us get better faster and thus perform better and hit those big targets we talked about in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then to your point, Drew, it makes managers look great too, because now they can actually point to the areas in which they're coaching, how they're coaching, and how quickly their team's getting better. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.